Srila Prabhupada begins this purport by referring to departments of law and order and stating that they emanate from the arms of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Here, arms means arms which are part of the body, because you might think that law and order to, comes from the arms, like the Sudarshan Chakra, which is also mentioned here. But uh, it's spelled the same way in English, but it means actually from the, the physical arms, not the... The Lord has so many. He has a sword, a discus, a club. Most of the weapons are, they're called arms, but most of them are actually wielded by the arms. <coughs> so the law and order department, everything emanates from the Supreme Law. Ahang sarvasya prabhavo matas sarvam prabhavite. Everything comes from Krishna. Here, particularly the maintenance of law and order, that comes from the Supreme Lord. Law and order he is in traditional societies, particularly in Vedic society, that is dispensed by the king, who is a representative of the Supreme Lord. Narananta. Naradhipam in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that among men I am the king when he's speaking about his vibhutis, vibhuti yoga, 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So among men the Supreme Lord is represented by the king. You might think, well, he's represented by the Brahmanas. That's also true. But uh, the king is more like the Supreme Lord than the Brahmana is, in the sense that the Brahmana takes the humble position of being a servant of the Lord, whereas a qualification for a Kshatriya, one of the qualifications of a Kshatriya mentioned in Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna is Ishvara Bhav, the feeling that I am the controller. Now, we also find in Bhagavad Gita that Lord Krishna says that, describing the demoniac mentality, says that <clears throat> Ishvara ham aham bhogi siddho ham balavan the, the demoniac person thinks, I am the controller, I am the Ishvara, I am the enjoyer, I am perfect, powerful and happy in this way. So to think that I am the controller is, first of all, it's an illusion, because only Krishna is the controller. And it's actually demoniac to think like that. But the Kshatriya, the qualities of the Kshatriya, which Krishna mentions in Bhagavad Gita, and praises them as, the, as good qualities, he mentions one of them as being Ishvara Bhav, the feeling that I am the controller. And not only the feeling, but he has all the trappings or accoutrements of being like God in many ways. He has a big palace, a big retinue, big retinue. Usually kings have more than one queen. And all the fine things are offered to him. And uh, all the good things in the universe, uh, in, in the kingdom, are supposed to be offered to him. We find that when Krishna entered Mathura, the, uh, he was chastised and he wanted to take from the washerman the, the nice cloth. But he said, don't you know that this is for the king? All good things should be offered to the king. So actually, what he was saying was true. But because he didn't, because the washerman didn't recognize that Krishna is Raja Raja, the king of kings. So, for saying that to Krishna, he got his head chopped off. 
just to show who's the real dispenser of law and order around here. This Kamsa was also dispensing law and order, but in a demoniac manner. So that was not appreciated by Krishna. In fact, Krishna came to this world specifically on the request of Bhumi Devi that there are so many demons posing as kings. So these demons, in many ways, they perform the function of king. They control, they have big palaces, uh, they maintain law and order. We find that when Dina Maharaj was there, he was a demoniac king, he was so demoniac that the Brahmins removed him by hum, humka, they, by vibrating the sound hum, they would kill him. But uh, in one sense he was good in as much as as long as he was there, the, the thieves were afraid. Everyone was afraid. The thieves were afraid that if they, if they tried to steal anything, they would be killed by Vena Maharaj. Because not that he was good, but that he wanted to keep all the good things for himself. So, but as soon as Vena Maharaj was killed, then all the thieves came out. Now it's time for a party. Sometimes I, I saw in the newspaper, sometimes it comes in. In America once, in one, some cities, there was a police strike. And then all the, as soon as that was declared, all the thieves came with big trucks. <laughs> and they, they smashed all the shop windows and they stole everything. And they, they went to the rich areas of town with big clubs and they just came and stole everything. Because they know the police are on strike. So, law and order is maintained by a strong king. And the demoniac kings, they may do that also. They, like Kang say, he was executing the function of a king in most ways. Of course, he was persecuting the Iswaraham and the bus controller or truck, truck asura. So uh, they were they were controlling. Prabhupada even mentioned that the, in one sense it wouldn't make much difference to the citizens whether Duryodhana was ruling or whether Yudhishthir was ruling. Because Duryodhan was also discharging his duty as the king. But the difference is that a saintly king, Rajarshi, along with his Ishvara Bhav, he knows that ultimately I am the servant of the Supreme Lord. I'm his representative, but I am not he directly. Similarly with Guru. Guru accepts worship and is considered to be of the same category of as the Supreme Lord, Vishnu Pad. Vishnu Pad means there are different meanings, but it means one who is situated at the feet of the Lord. It also means one who is in the same position as the Supreme Lord. So, the Guru is to be respected as much as the Supreme Lord. Sakshad Dharitvena Samastha Shastra Yuktastata Bhavyata Evasad. Kintu. But there is a proviso also. To be respected as much as the Supreme Lord, but Kintu. But. But. Kintu Prabha Ya Priya Evatas. He's to be understood as good as the Supreme Lord because he's very dear to him, not the Supreme Lord directly. So, all these bogus gurus, one of their favorite things they like to teach is that Guru is God. It's not correct. Guru is to be respected as much as the Supreme Lord and he, in many ways he takes the position of God. Krishna instructs Bhagavad Gita and Guru also instructs Bhagavad Gita. The difference is, 
that Krishna does so in the first person and the Guru does so in the third person. Guru sa- Krishna says, Savadhanam Parityadya Ma Mekam Sharanamrata Give up all varieties of religion, surrender to me. And Guru teaches, quotes the same verse, but says surrender to Krishna. He doesn't say, he doesn't say surrender to me. Actually, he may do also. He's a, you, you're only supposed to surrender to the Guru. But surrenders to the Guru because the Guru directs that surrender to Krishna. We don't surrender to the Guru just because he's the Guru, but because he is the representative of Krishna and he transmits that offering of service and surrender to Krishna. But if the Guru thinks that this worship is meant for me, then in the words of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, then the, in the word Guru, which means, in Bengali it means cow, the word Guru, the first, the first Uka becomes cut. That means that instead of being Guru, it becomes Guru becomes uh, no more eligible to impart spiritual knowledge than a cow. So, like that, guru, king, they accept great worship and honor and they require to take that position to, to, to discharge their duty. If they fail to do so, then they cannot properly execute their function. If the king, just like this actually very foolish idea of Mahatma Gandhi, non-violence, and there should be no violence in human society whatsoever. We, we live by the principle of non-violence. And this just means that some violent person will come and dominate you. So it's, it's foolish. Violence is required. In not, instead of ahimsa, ahimsa is a general principle, which Lord Krishna also glorifies in Bhagavad Gita while inciting Arjuna to fight. But in Srimad Bhagavatam, we have a more specific definition, it's given there, Nati Hrinsrena, that a devotee should not be violent any more than required. Some violence is required. It's impossible to have total non-violence. You see the Jains, they... Uh, they put some cloth over their mouth so they won't breathe in any insect. But then even in the manufacture of that cloth, some uh, insect may have been killed. <laughs> Isn't it? It's made from cotton and then they have to pick the, the cotton from the plant. Or they sweep the road so they don't tread on any insect. But by sweeping they may be killing some insect also. So, it's impossible to avoid all violence. Therefore, nati hing srena, one should not be excessively violent. But some violence is required. Violence is required to curb those who would inflict violence on others out of base motives. If one wants to forcibly take another's wealth, or if one wants to simply uh, torture others, that is one symptom of Kali Yoga, Vitahimsa, meaningless violence, one of the symptoms of Kali Yoga. So he should be checked. But how will you check a person who's violent? If a person of violent disposition, I want to forcibly steal from you, and you say, Well, I believe in Ahimsa. Okay, that's very nice. Thank you very much. And you just take your money. Don't be violent. <laughs> so it's an impractical philosophy in a bad world. Therefore, it is required that there be a class in society of persons 
who are trained to be violent for the sake of curbing the to be riotously violent for the sake of curbing the unrighteous violence of rascals. That means at the same time, simultaneously, they have to be saintly, rishi, and violent, raja. So generally, violence is not acquainted with saintliness. But on the other hand, we have the, uh, the example of Hanuman, who is the very emblem of dasya, service, who became so violent against Ravana that he burned Lanka. And that's famous. Not on, and then later he killed so many of Ravana's men in the, in the battle. But that was that was uh, this violence was engendered by the violent activity of Ravana. Just as an aside, going off a little bit of a tangent here, one of the commentators on Ramayana has stated that the whole problem, that all, the, all the Ravana, the, the whole thing came about, this whole big problem came about because of non-protection of women. That women should always be protected. It means they should not be allowed to do or run around freely as they like. And this is not a modern it was an ancient commentator, Stinti. And he stated that the root of the problem actually wasn't even Sita's being unprotected, but Shuparnaka. Because what happened, Ravana somehow killed her husband. And then he's, as he said, okay, well, what to do? So now you just go and you do whatever you like as, as compensation. You do whatever you like and you can go wherever you like and do whatever you like and don't worry, I'll, no one can argue with you because if they argue with you, they have to argue with me. And no one argues with me because <laughs> I just kill them. They start to argue, I just kill them. And that's all. And I might just kill them before they argue if I don't like the look on their face. That's Ravana. Ravana means one who causes others to cry. So, sure, Shurpanak... Shurpanaka. Shurpan, no, Shurpanaka. Long Shurpanaka. That's the actual. So she was just wandering around here and there, being a Rakshasi, eating up people here and there. And, uh, and, and then she, she saw Ram and she thought, Looks good. Don't think I'll eat this one. I'll enjoy with it. He said, well, uh, you know the story. He said, well, there's, there's Sita. It doesn't matter, I'll eat her. And then I'll just eat her up for breakfast and then you can accept me instead. So the whole problem came because she was unprotected. No law and order. She was independent woman, free to do as she liked. So... I went off on a tangent. Well, how do we get back to what I was talking about? One of my favorite topics. Uh, the, the king, he rules on behalf of the Lord and violence, yes, he has to, violence should be inflicted. Hanuman is famous as the emblem of Dasya Bhakti. And generally, he's very peaceful. He sits and chants, Ram, Ram, Ram. But when violence is required, he's prepared to go to any length if it's required to serve the Lord. So violence generally is not considered a very good policy. But in this material world, sometimes it is necessary. Because without violence, 
then the, without violence properly discharged, then uh, Durta, the rascals, they will come up and inflict their violence. So it's, uh, it's considering that a little violence properly administered protects society from uh, uncontrolled violence. It's a basic principle which is going on at the present time, at least we're told it's going on in Iraq, that America has come to the assistance of or invaded Iraq, depending on your political outlook. And they say that, well, this is to, it's actually to, it was to deliver the Iraqi people from their previous leader, who was unnecessary, unnecessarily violent in dealing with them, and also to protect the American people from terrorism. So the idea is that by, it, by some violence inflicted in Iraq will save America and the world from much worse violence. So that's the logic that's being employed. So we, we accept this logic. We don't believe in uh, just non-violence, that all terrorists should come and do whatever they like, and we just say non, we'll, we're non-violent. Sometimes by, by killing one person, you can stop the killing of many other persons. Just like there was a, about 1943 or so, it was already seen that the Germans, they were going to lose the war. It was just a matter of time. So some of the top German military staff, they conspired to kill Hitler because he didn't want to surrender under any circumstances. They had to come right up to, they didn't surrender until the, until the uh, Allied forces reached Berlin, they, they wouldn't surrender. They just kept on killing more and more people because they kept on resisting. So they thought, let us kill Hitler. Because if we kill him, then we'll save so many Germans and others. They weren't so much concerned about the others. But somehow Hitler found out about it and those... And then those, they all got executed, including his top general, Rommel. Anyway, this is his script. But uh, they thought that now the, the war is lost. We can't win this war. But if we go on fighting, then Germany will be in a worse position and be more and more people killed. So better we be realistic and surrender now. But Hitler, Hitler wouldn't have it, so they wanted to kill Hitler. We'll kill him, one man, and that will save so many lives. But that was also the logic for the professed logic for America's dropping the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That if we, we are, definitely we are going to defeat Japan, even before the war finished, the heads of the Churchill and Roosevelt, they were coming together and making plans what to do after the war, because they were sure they were going to win it. Uh, once the Americans joined, they knew they were going to win. But uh, they knew the Japanese, they wouldn't, they, like, just like the Germans, they wouldn't surrender. They'd just go on and on fighting. And so they thought, well, let's show them that there's no hope for you to win. So then they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and, and then they surrendered. So they, they, the logic for that is that they saved so many lives by doing so. Maybe 100,000 or more people were killed in the, by these two bombs. But if the war had gone on, then so many more people would have been killed. That's the logic. I don't necessarily accept it, but, but uh, it's just, there's a statement in, there's a word in English, I don't know where it comes from, but it's called real politics. It means realistic politics. You can have theories of you be nice, I be nice, but in actual life, politics is, as Samuel Johnson, I think, said, that politics is the last resort of scoundrels. 
So you can't expect politicians to be very nice because politics by its very definition means not very nice. When it comes to time for elections, they go and pat babies on the head. And then when they get elected, they make plans how to kill all their political enemies and so many things. So real politics, mean just being realistic. Politics means you have to do so many things which are not nice. The Kshatriyas, they go to the forest and they, they kill because they may have to, to Kshatriya, they have to fight to kill their enemies and if when they see some blood they start vomiting and their legs start wobbling, then how are they going to fight? So they have to they have to see blood and they have to face scary situations. If you go in the forest, you have to fight some tiger. It's a, it's a genuine, real-life, scary situation in which you could get killed. So they, they face that. They're ready for that. They're ready to fight. They're not, they're not afraid to fight. They're practiced to fight. They're not squeamish. There's the... Who was that? Dushant, was it? Or Bharat? He would fight with... He was brought up in the forest and he would fight with lions barehanded and kill them. Therefore, this land is called Bharat. Such a great Kshatriya. So, they have to be prepared for that. So, Kshatriya, he may be the representative of God, but he has to be prepared to do things which are not very nice. Once I was on a train from Hyderabad to Bombay on Diwali day, so I thought if I go on Diwali the train will be practically empty, so no problem. And it wasn't full, but it was mostly full of Christians and Muslims. <laughs> so, uh, so this one Christian, as he started trying to convert me, which is a pretty stupid thing to do. But anyway, one of his things, he was... These people, they, they're actually very obnoxious. I don't think they're at all close to God at all. But uh, he started saying, Oh, you see, our Jesus, he is the Prince of Peace. But your Krishna is killing so many people. This is one of his objections. I said to him, whichever way you take it, everyone is being killed by God, directly or indirectly. Of course, they're meatheads, so they can't understand any philosophy. <laughs> they can't understand any philosophy. So, very, what they say in the name of God, it's, it's actually the worst disservice to actual religion. Anyone who's in, actually intelligent, they should reject this. I, I mean, I, I, at about the age of 12, I, I was able to work out that my Christian upbringing, whatever they were talking, was just all nonsense. That God loves you, but He sends you to hell forever if you don't, if you don't believe in Him. And only the, only the Christians, or only the Catholics in my case, go to heaven. And so, and everyone else goes to hell. And, you know, what is this? And God likes, it. God likes the Christians and he doesn't like the Buddhists and the Hindus. And the other religions, they're also talking about God, but they just completely reject. So, I, I, can, I can understand. As Bhaktino Thakur said, that according to their religion, God, first of all, someone had an apple, and as a result of that, the whole human race is condemned. Uh, but then God, He came to this world and He died. And in this way, you got free from the sin of your forefather eating an apple. By God dying. So, Bhaktivinoda Thakur summarized that no intelligent person could accept this. So, what are they saying about? Yeah, they say, one of the things they say, that I, a, a Muslim came to speak to me fairly recently in South India. 
young Muslim man. He was presenting himself as a very open-minded person, but actually he was trying to convert me. So, by, 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 he was pretending to be very open-minded, and yes, we also, I also read Bhagavad Gita. So I took him up on the point of that, well, how, you know, how if you're so religious that you eat animals and you, you bleed them to death? That's not very nice, that causes so much suffering. He said, well, in the Quran it said that God gave all the other species for man to have dominion over, to enjoy. So, really? Well, what about the mosquito? How do you enjoy the mosquito? <laughs> How do you enjoy the scorpion? And what about these species that they're like at the bottom of the sea, five miles at the bottom of the sea, and only recently some intrepid scientists have discovered them by going down there to the depths of the sea. Uh, they, they, to date, the human they, they, they've been in existence for thousands and, of years. You mean God put them there just so that in the year 2004 some scientists could go down there and have the enjoyment of saying, I discovered them? It doesn't make any sense. No sense. They have no sense. But they're simply dogmatic. So what they're saying in the name of religion, it's actually totally not at all intelligent and totally misleading. That I was saying Guru also represents God, but mostly they're, they're totally misleading. Very, very bad disservice. In Kali Yoga, what is taught in the name of religion is so misleading. That's why I often say that the, the, the very symptom that we have no good government in this country or any country is that these people are allowed to go on. In uh, once uh, a few years ago, some people came to kill one certain famous Baba, very famous in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, anyway, he ran away. He's supposed to be gone, but he exhibited his leela of running away. Of course, Krishna also did that. He's known as Ranchor, but before that, he just to show that actually he's, he's no need for him to be afraid. Seventeen times before, he killed all the forces of Jarasandha and so many different demons. So when he runs away, we know it's not because he's afraid, but he has some other purpose to execute. But if the first time someone comes to, to uh, attack this so-called Bhagawan, and he just runs away, that makes us think that, well, maybe... If we hadn't been thinking previously, if we're so foolish that we hadn't been thinking so previously, it might make us think, well, actually, he's not Bhagavan at all. He's just some cheater. So they came to uh, shoot him or stab him or whatever. Unfortunately, they weren't successful. But um, it's a sign of, of wrong government that such persons are allowed to live. People sometimes ask us, well, what do you think about this guru and that guru? We can tell them. It just, it just shows there's no proper government in this country. They should have lined them up and shot them. People become shocked when I say that, but actually if you consider, just like the, is Saddam Hussein, he's still in prison in America or what? Is he? What is it? He's still there? So they're thinking what they should do. Should they shoot him or what? Should they execute him? So the idea is that uh, by executing such a person, of course it's a little late now, but if they'd done so previously, they would have saved the lives of so many people who he unnecessarily killed. The, the ruler has the right to kill people but that has to be, that right has to be, uh, I, I don't use the word executed, but that right has to be used uh, in a discriminatory manner. 
according to the laws of dharma. But if, if one, if the king just simply starts killing people all over the place for no good reason, then he is a rascal, and it would be good to kill him in such a case. Just like Vena Maharaj was killed by the Brahmanas for, for misappropriating his position. So it's the same thing, the idea to kill someone to save others. So in the same way, all these bogus gurus, if they're not prepared to shut up, they should actually be executed because it would save so many people from the terrible fate that awaits them by their offenses, just like this Baba in South India. They distribute cassettes of Venkatesh Suprabhatam, but changed, instead of saying that, uh, what is it? Satadrinata, something like this. Satava Suprabhata. How does that go? Venkatesh Suprabhata. Hmm? No, no, the last line, the refrain, it comes up every time. Anyway, instead of putting the name of Venkatesh, they put the name, all the same thing. They put, and at the end they put this Baba's name. So that is extremely sinful. Extremely sin. The, the pure devotional sentiments of great devotees for the Supreme Lord, which have been composed in beautiful poems, and instead of teaching people to chant that, which is very good, they change it and put his name instead. This is extremely sinful. By chanting the actual Venkatesh Suprabhatam, one gets the fruit of bhakti. One is purified. But by just that little change, by, by, by pretending that he is that person, and don't chant the name of Venkatesh, chant the name of this Baba, then the same beautiful prayer by that little change, that instead of going to Vaikuntha, one goes to the worst hell. So actually these people, they should be executed. It's a sign that there's no proper government, that they don't know how to dispense law and order. They should. The, the, the kings or the rulers, they should be very strict. But in, they should, just like we find Parikshit Maharaj, he was prepared to kill the personality of Kali for beating a bull. But now the modern leaders they themselves announce very proudly, proudly, we have opened a new automated mechanized slaughterhouse. So see, just see what rascals. Therefore, one of the symptoms of Kali Yoga is said, Prajaste Bhakshiyashanti Mlecha Rajanya Rupinaha. That in Kali Yoga, Mlechas, a Sanskrita Kriyahinam. Mlechas who are asanskrit, they don't, they've never gone through any purificatory ceremonies. And Kriyahina, they, they never perform any auspicious activities. They're simply meat-eating rascals. But they take the position of kings. And their business is to eat the citizens. Either literally or, uh, what's the word, uh, allegorically. Some of them, there, there was, in Africa in recent times, there were at least two heads of states who used to eat the citizens. One was Idi Amin in the 1970s, it must have been. And another was in Liberia. They actually ate their political, after executing their political opponents, which means probably everybody in the country, because nobody liked them, they would actually eat their flesh. So, uh, and also praja, the animals are also praja, so they're eating the animals. They're supposed to be protecting the animals, but instead they're killing them. So, law and order situation is very bad. But what can you expect in a society run by demons? On the one hand, they encourage women to enter beauty contests and to walk around showing off their bodies in such a way as to incite lust. And on the other hand, they complain, oh, the rape 
cases are increasing. Such fools. Such fool. It's, it's unbelievably foolish. And they show on TV so many murders and, and then they, there's, and what are we, then they sit down and have a conference. What are we going to do about the murder rate increasing? They're advertising. Practically, they're advertising. Yes, you can do. And then they're surprised how it's increasing. Why are the people becoming bad? They're so foolish. So to actually bring law and order into society, that is the work of a representative of God. Anyone but a representative of God who rules according to Dharma, he will become a victim of the adage, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That is not necessarily true. If the ruler understands that even though apparently I have absolute power, actually absolute power is only with Krishna, so I am only a servant, then he won't become corrupted. And we have so many examples in Vedic history, not in modern history, but in Vedic history we have so many examples of rulers who have full power in the state, but they do not misuse them. This is the best system of government. As one teacher at school said to me, in all those years at school, one teacher said two things that I remember that were actually uh, correct, very valuable insights. Maybe I should try and find him out. He said two things which, which at the time I couldn't accept, but later on I could understand. By they're actually, It's actually in line with Shastra, which he'd come to by his he'd come to by his own intelligence. One thing he said was that the only, or, or the best systems of government, the best system of government is um, beneficial, that's not the word. Benefit, what's the word he used exactly? Uh, benign, no. But it's something, beneficial dictatorship. Benevolent, that's the word. Benevolent dictatorship. Thank you. And beneficial and benign and the word is uh, and, and then and another thing he said he said is that which I also couldn't believe at the time he said that actually sex isn't so wonderful he said that uh, once you get married and you have access to it because I guess he was a somewhat pious person he was wasn't doing outside of marriage, he said that you are, you know, it's not such a big thing like it's advertised to be. So, benevolent dictatorship is... But then he said about benevolent dictatorship, he said, but actually it's not possible. Very difficult, actually. We find, even in our Krishna consciousness movement, that often Leaders, because we are, they're, they're given a lot of authority. So, it's often seen that they, they, they take that to become some kind of, you know, domineering and not actually very benevolent in the dispensation of justice. It's just that I'm right because I'm right. That's all. So no intelligent person will accept this. So, even I'm just giving this example because even in our Krishna conscious room where we have such high ideals, but it's often seen, and I must admit, I also went through a period of that, of being a little Hitler. So, it's very difficult to find that... Uh, actually enlightened benevolent 
dispensation of authority. But it's required, otherwise how are we to preach Krishna consciousness in the world? There must be some organization. Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur said that the, the greatest enemy, enemy of religion in the world is organized religion. The greatest enemy of theism is organized religion. He said the churches, they are the, the churches and the religious organizations, they are the greatest enemies of theism. But then he himself also organized a, a religious organization. Because to preach in this world, it's required. Otherwise, you can just go and sit under a tree somewhere and chant Hare Krishna. But then how to preach Krishna consciousness all over the world? Some organization is required. So he may say, well, we won't have any organization. But then it becomes more chaotic. Or he may say, well, we don't like money, so we won't collect any money. But then if you're to preach widely, then money is also required. Just like some of our devotees, they, they, they don't want that their followers should be corrupted by collecting money. But then when they want to do some big preaching program, they have to go to those who are collecting money and ask, hey, can you help? So, Prabhupada also said that, you see, he was referring to the fact that Traditionally, mat means no, no women, because as Prabhupada said, man is good, woman is good, but the combination is not good. And sadhus, they join, they, they go to join some mat to live independently from women so that they can be undisturbed in their execution of bhakti or whatever line they're in. Sadhu means of course, one can be a grihasta sadhu also, but generally it's considered sadhu means one who lives aloof from women. But Prabhupada in the Western countries accepted women to live in the ashram, which he was much criticized for by his god brothers. But he saw that preaching is preaching to all spirit souls in the human form of life. And previously, women, they could, ex or at least in India, they could execute Krishna consciousness at home but under the protection of their husband or father or whatever. But Prabhupada saw there was no such facility in the Western countries because there was no proper atmosphere at home for them. And many of them weren't living at home anyway. They were already living independently. So Prabhupada allowed, come and live in the ashram. But he said, that, but I, I, they have come to Krishna, I have to accept them. But so many problems are caused. Because of bringing men and women into proximity. One time, Giriraj Maharaj asked Prabhupada that, he said, We have the perfect philosophy, we have the, the perfect system of religion, chanting the holy names, and we have the perfect spiritual master, then why do we still have so many problems? Very good question. Prabhupada said, because the brahmacharis and sannyasis associate with women too much. <laughs> so just see, there's violence is required. Getting back to that point. It's not nice, but it's part of this material world. It's, it's, it's inevitable in this material world that some violence is required to maintain law and order so that people can live peacefully. To maintain peace, violence is required. It sounds contradictory, but in real life we see. If there's no police, police go on strike, then immediately the, the, the uh, looters come. So, it's necessary in human society. But one who can maintain law and order according to Vedic principles without any personal motive, such a person is a representative of Krishna. And lacking such persons, how much we are suffering in human society.
because of lack of real brahmanas and real kshatriyas, how much human society is suffering. Prabhupada wanted to restore human society to Krishna conscious position. He said, first there should be brahmanas. Brahmana means disinterested, no personal interest. He only lives for the sake of others. Kshatri also lives for the sake of others. In different ways. With the cooperation of Brahmanas and Kshatriyas, then human society can be properly organized. Hare Krishna. Is there any question?